Well, my name is John Broxton, and on behalf of the International Film Music Critics Association, I'm very pleased to present the 2017 IFMCA Award for Best Original Score for a Comedy Film to Christopher Willis for The Death of Stalin. Many congratulations. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. And thank you very much to the International Film Music Critics Association. Um, this, uh, this is a huge honour, and uh, it was a... a a huge piece of work to put together. I uh, I need to thank the director, Armando Iannucci, um, without whose bravery I definitely wouldn't be here. He was the one who was happy to have a such an old-fashioned and bombastic sounding score. Um, we had a huge orchestra, the musicians were, were wonderful. Um, uh, I need to thank um, uh, music editor Andy Glenn and uh, my soundtrack editor Elise Willis, who's also my wife. Um, uh, thank you so much. Absolutely delighted. So many congratulations again, Chris, on the award. Um, oh, thanks. Can you talk a little bit about your your background? Um, obviously, you you moved from the United uh, from the United Kingdom to the US. Um, you know your education and how you got into film music in the first place. Certainly. Yeah. Well. Um, uh, I've always loved films, uh, always loved music and always loved films, uh, but I didn't, um, it didn't occur to me for many years to, to, to get into film music. I didn't really think about the music in films an enormous amount. There were certain things that I loved when I was, when I was young. Um, uh, the Star Wars films are sort of my earliest memories, pretty much. Um, <laughs> you and every other composer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I literally, I have, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that my first memory that couldn't be a photo is, uh, you know, you know, when you when you remember certain things and then you realise that that they're actually photos of that thing. And right. It can't actually be a memory. Is of is of the 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 text crawl at the start of Return of the Jedi in really? 1980, whatever it was. Three, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> when I would have been five. Um, uh, but I, I was very much. Uh, into classical music. I had a sort of class, uh, a typical music nerd childhood. Uh, I got completely obsessed with the piano, um, obsessed with composing. Um, uh, I wasn't exactly sure what to what to do. Uh, I went to Cambridge for my undergrad, which is a very old-fashioned undergrad. We do a lot of um, history and a lot of analysis. Um, and then I studied the piano at the Royal Academy of Music, uh, thinking that I would become a pianist, although I'm not sure if I was ever sure I really was serious about it. Right. Um, and I was a concert pianist for a few years and was incredibly restless, went back to Cambridge again and did a PhD uh, in musicology. Uh, and was sort of becoming a musicologist. Um, again, I'm not sure if I was really sure about that and it eventually and I'd been composing all this time too I should say um, and then it sort of hit me fairly suddenly that um, that, uh, that that I'd been sort of blinded to the thing that I should really be doing um, also in the 90s in Britain maybe more than now maybe more than in certain places in America being a composer within classical music was something that I found very difficult to come to terms with. Mm. There was a very kind of doctrinaire, atonal landscape. Um, uh, I had some very frustrating experiences with composition teachers where I, I wanted them to teach me the rudiments of music. And um, when you get past a certain age in classical music and you say you want to be a composer, um, uh, people don't want to teach you the rudiments of music. They want to, they want to, um, uh, they want you to to come to them with with atonal right. um, meanderings, which which um, or at least they did. So so it took me many years to, to to establish what I wanted to do. But then very suddenly I put together a demo that was that was in a film music style, and um, got a job uh, in the studio of Rupert Gregson Williams uh, uh, over here in LA. And I moved out here, and it, things happened then very suddenly right. <laughs> after all the, the sort of nomadic years of, of restlessness. Right. What's, what sort of projects did you work on with Rupert in the first few years? Um, 
I did some score reading. That's how I that's how I met him. Just to come into the to a session and 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 read through the score and try and spot things that were being played wrong. Um, uh, the first time we met was on uh, Over the Hedge. Uh, it was a oh, dream, the DreamWorks film. film. Yeah, 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 wonderful score. Um, uh, and uh, and then more of the same on uh, on B Movie and Click the uh, the Adam Sandler film. Mm. And then when I came out here, he was he was on a kind of run of doing romantic comedies, which actually, uh, looking back, suited me incredibly well because um, there was not too much. Uh, it wasn't, you know, oceans and oceans of music happening. It, right. it could have been, could have been, I think, uh, I think worse for someone coming in like I was and actually knowing very, very little about films and film music. Right. He, would, he was very, very patient. Explain musically. I think I was, uh, I, I had something to offer. But in terms of production, music production and films, um, uh, I, I owe him an enormous debt of gratitude because he he explained a lot of things that I was completely uh, yeah, <laughs> clueless about. Right. And then, of course, Veep was a fairly major project for you. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, which we did together. Mm. Um, uh, I had secretly been, uh, not secretly, but when I first met Armando, I didn't tell him because I was too embarrassed that I was an enormous fan of his. Had been since, um, since I was, you know, since uh, On the Hour first uh, right. came out in the 90s. Yeah. Um, so I think there was a, a, an advantage, even though Veep didn't need very much music. Um, there was, there were, I had a, I had a sense from the prehistory of of all the people involved in writing and editing and and directing Veep of of kind of what was going on stylistically. So even though ostensibly we were just doing these little things, I think there was a there was a sort of um, secret weapon which was my British comedy fandom right. <laughs> going back many years. And so I would imagine that your association with Veep and Armando is what led directly to Death of Stalin. I mean, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, our communication was actually fairly sporadic through Veep. Um, he was already a, a peripatetic, you know, traveling back and forth between Baltimore and London, editing in London and shooting in Baltimore. So, um, and I was here in LA. So uh, we didn't see each other that much, but it was around the time he was finishing that we met up. Uh, and both of us happened to be free and not uh, incredibly busy. And we had this great long conversation and he told me about Stalin. And also we, we talked a lot finally about classical music, which we both, I think, knew that, we, that, that, that it would be fun to talk about. Because he, of course, um, is a big authority on classical music. He right. um, wrote a magazine column on classical music. Um, so we, we had a wide ranging chat about lots of things, but including the film. Um, and it kind of uh, kind of took off from there. Right. Now, uh, Death of Stalin, obviously for anybody who's heard the soundtrack, um, is very heavily influenced by Russian classical music. Mm. Um, I understand that that was very much Armando's idea, that he wanted the inspiration from you know, Prokofiev and Shostakovich and all these great Russian masters. That must have been quite daunting coming into that thing for him to say, <laughs> go and write like Prokofiev. Can you can you talk a little bit about the process of that and how how that came to be? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's possible that he might have been open to it, sort of having that flavour, but not being precisely that. Um, so I, it it may have come partly from my enthusiasm to be like, yes, we should definitely do that. That would be such a strange thing to do in the current climate. Right. Um, but I don't know, because I don't know, there's no counterfactual of what would have, had I started giving him back things that were sort of um, not not um, quite as slavish as they, as they were, I don't know what he would have said, but that, um, yeah, I, I, I uh, was, was enthused when he suggested it, but also, as you say, as you suggested, very nervous. Yeah. Uh, and I went off and uh, studied uh, the Soviet composers uh, at great length um, and I was writing music but uh, but not actually intending to use it just just writing things and throwing them away because because it was so difficult to sort of get into that um, that mindset um, that was sort of over the summer before I actually got the film for the first time and what I noticed is that I carried on 
getting more and more comfortable with it. So by the end, I was actually composing very fast and and right. and and not worrying as much about it. Whereas at the start, it was this enormous intellectual headache to 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 be constantly thinking about well, how do those how do they think? How do they get from one key to another or one note to another? It's so right. um, it's so tangible, but but it's actually very uh, very difficult to to sum up. Right. Um, one of the things that I thought was very interesting about the film was the, the, ju the juxtaposition between having this very, very grand, bombastic, thematic music right. against what is essentially a, f a farce comedy. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the music and the film and how it works? Because it shouldn't, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not... The more I think about it, it's, it's, it's not entirely straightforward. Uh, I think... It, in different scenes, it's doing a different, it's it's operating a different way. Um, sometimes it's it's just playing the bits that are not comedic. It's 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 like the sets and the and the and the costumes. It's it's um, playing the spectacle. Just playing the spectacle. That's right. a good way of putting it. And and reminding us from time to time what's at stake because the film is it, it reminds us sometimes. You know, when we go out into outside the Kremlin and we see Russia, we're reminded that people are people are dying as a result of of the decisions that are being made. Um, sometimes it's uh, it's never playing the comedy straightforwardly. Um, I, I noticed when I got the film that it was already funny. It works with no music at all right. comedically, so there's no sense of um, having uh, to save the film from its yes, yeah. or even just sort of boy it along in the way that that, that one might um, in a in an animation or something, just right. sort of keep keep the keep keep a certain a certain ambience that encourages you to to laugh. Um, but yeah, there's this there's this jarring quality that's 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 not sincere at all, where you go you go way over the top, um, like in the slow motion um, uh, sections. Uh, when you, you're introduced to characters in slow motion, right? And what you what you're seeing is very preposterous, but what you're hearing is very um, is very serious. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, what was I going to say about that? The, yeah, well, one of the things that, that that was in my mind once we'd got going was uh, was a sort of spoof tradition. Mm. You know, things like um, Young Frankenstein, or even this is not a spoof actually, but the wonderful um, Elmer Bernstein. Score to Ghostbusters, right? Which really, by and large, just goes for it and just just plays the 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 scare, the and drama, not the, right? Um, uh, and I think that can that can work very well. Of course, the Death of Stalin isn't a spoof, but this 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 sense that the music never really gives the game away. Right. Um, uh, we also enjoyed the fact that some of those Soviet symphonies, like for instance, in the in the in the Output of Shostakovich. There's lots of people who, uh, even even Shostakovich's biggest fans, would say, you know, there are, there are very angular, difficult pieces, um, and then there are these almost kind of schlocky pieces that he wrote, you know, for to for um, to court favor with Stalin and, right. and with the authorities, um, and it's it's fun to go there actually. That right. latter thing go, to to go very schlocky and and over the top. Almost as though you were channeling what he was channeling at the time. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, yeah, it's, it's, it becomes quite of course quite cinematic, and of course he was doing films. It's not a million miles from Alex North or right. you know, lots of things that were happening on, right. on both sides of the divide. Right. Um, so obviously the, the the film has just come out in the United States. Um, there was a, a premiere, which obviously was a major thing for you because they had the score performed live to picture. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and what that was like? Well, that was terrific. Um, we, yeah, we were incredibly fortunate that IFC um, decided that they'd like to uh, to present the film in LA like that. Um, uh, and uh, Wordless Music, who are a New York-based group, um, Put together the concert and did an amazing job. Um, uh, it's tough. I mean, it 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 works so nicely because the film is the film is period. The film has a classical concert in it. 
there's something very apt about seeing the orchestra in front of you while you watch the film. So it, it was it had to happen once once they suggested it. Right. Um, but the orchestra that we had for the session for the recording sessions was enormous. We had uh, 80 people. Uh, we recorded in Belgium, and it was uh, a huge, very Soviet-style orchestra. Uh, we, you know, more a bigger orchestra than than you might normally have on a film. Um, more flutes, more clarinets, more strings, just a, just sort of heaviness. And you literally wouldn't have been able to fit 80 people on the stage that we had at Ace Theatre in uh, downtown LA. So we had to make some changes. Right. Uh, and some of the music's very, very, very difficult. It's like it's like a, a, a Soviet, you know, a Shostakovich or a Weinberg symphony. It's it's intended to be uh, rehearsed at great length. <laughs> I take uh, it that didn't happen with this. <laughs> <laughs> they did have a, a decent amount of time to rehearse, oh. but it's it, what's what's not intended in a Shostakovich symphony is that you should simultaneously be worrying about staying in in time with a movie. Right. Um, uh, the wonderful uh, conductor Ryan McAdams, who kept it all together, I was amazed with the job that he did. Um, so all round a thrilling, thrilling experience. Good. Um, is there anything that you're uh, you're working on right now that you can tell us about that you're that we can look forward to hearing? Oh sure. Well, um, I've been doing uh, uh, these uh, Mickey Mouse shorts for for Disney. These short cartoons. Uh, uh, we are in season four right now, and season five uh, is, is has been confirmed. But um, we're now turning that into a ride for uh, Disney World, which oh. is. Um, opening next year uh, so this is an incredibly exciting it's a, it's a enormous area of land that they have available for it uh, it'll be I think the biggest ride in any of their parks wow. and it'll be in some ways a very old-fashioned ride in that the it, the the, um, the story is a is a new story it'll be based around a new song very much like the oldest rides um, uh, it's a small world. Disney, yeah, it's a on. small world. Right. And the pirate's life for me, right. and grim grinning ghosts. Right. Um, it's been it's been wonderful, sort of becoming a student of that um, of that history right. and working that out. So we have our we have our song, and we're now constructing the whole thing uh, around it. Um, it's going to be like like the shorts. It's going to be uh, very retro, very vintage. Uh, quite a lot of. Uh, quite a lot of kitschy mid-century modern details. Um, uh, yeah, really excited about it. Oh, that sounds wonderful. That's okay, uh, thank you very much. Congratulations again, and uh, thanks. Continued success. Hope I didn't waffle too much. No, no, it's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> heavens. <laughs> you used that bit at the end. Hope I didn't waffle too much.